Fresh air. It's one of the many things we take for granted every day. But just how clean is the air we breathe in the U.S.? The air quality in the U.S. is generally good, uh, but I would say there are definitely some areas, both areas in terms of economic sector and areas in terms of geography that could stand to, to be improved. Air pollution still remains one of the key environmental issues in the United States. Although it has seen incredible improvements since the 1970s, the number of Americans exposed to air pollution has consistently stayed over 125 million since 2013. Between 2017 and 2019, about 4 in 10 Americans are estimated to have lived in counties with poor air quality. It can cause people to cough and wheeze, have shortness of breath. Uh, particle pollution can get into the blood and can lead to heart attacks or stroke. It is impacting you whether you know it or not. I have to be acutely aware of it because I may go into an asthma attack and then I'm down for several days. Um, but people don't realize that over time, this is cumulative. Every year, air pollution is responsible for six million premature deaths worldwide from heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes. But while the health effects of air pollution is often discussed, what is perhaps far less publicized is its impact on the economy. When we total up those impacts, looking at morbidity, that is premature illness and uh, premature mortality, um, we get impacts that on monetary terms on the order of 3 to 7 percent of GDP every year. Every year, air pollution alone is estimated to cost the U.S. roughly 3 percent of its GDP in damages, or $617 billion. So how does air pollution harm our economy, and can we fix it? Air pollution consists of gas and particle contaminants that have either been released directly into the atmosphere or created in the air via complex chemical reactions. Between 2017 and 2019, more than 135 million Americans lived with polluted air, putting their health and lives at risk. Seeing reports about air pollution are very alarming to me because this is something I'm li I've lived with my whole life. Other people around the United States and the world, they don't know that they're living with it. They don't see uh, what the impact is. There are many types of contaminants that contribute to air pollution in the United States, but there are a few that grasp the attention of researchers. Generally, there are two um, local air pollutants that the US EPA um, and other researchers tend to focus on. Those are fine particulate matter, or PM 2.5, and tropospheric or ground level ozone. Particle pollution refers to tiny pieces of solids or liquids in the air, consisting of contaminants like dust, dirt, soot, and smoke. Nearly 21 million people in the US are estimated to live in counties with unhealthy levels of particle pollution year round. It really is the byproduct of combustion, and it, it comes to very small, uh, much smaller than a human hair, uh, these bits of or particles that are in the air. You can often see them when you look at a sunset and you see all that, that, that haze uh, in, in the evening. Well, that can get into your lungs and it can cause a wide range of harm. Ground level ozone pollutants are often better known by another name, smog. It's created when pollutants from cars, power plants, and other known sources chemically react in the air under sunlight. More than 123 million people in the U.S. are thought to live in counties with bad ozone pollution just over 28 million of them being children, and 18.2 million age 65 or older. These pollutants cook in the atmosphere and form this ozone, which is a gas, and it can then uh, cause these uh, wide range of adverse health consequences. Uh, it's likened to like a sunburn of the lung because it irritates the respiratory tract. While poor air quality can be harmful to just about anyone, it's especially harmful to the most vulnerable populations, the young, the elderly, and those with pre-existing conditions. We always had to be, no matter where it was, uh, no matter where we went, making sure, like now, I, I never leave home without making sure I have my rescue inhaler with me. I always want to know what air quality is during a given day, so I'm, I have news apps open that monitor air quality, and that becomes a way of life that is norm for me. The effects of air pollution doesn't just stop with the health of Americans. Poor air quality has a direct impact on the economy, costing the U.S. as much as $600 billion annually. For a long time, the way we have calculated monetary costs from air pollution involves what's called the damage function approach. And so 
That means we link economic activity, say burning coal or natural gas or oil to, to make a product. And from that production process, whether it's me driving in my car or a firm running a factory, there are emissions that result. And in the damage function approach, we model those emissions, meaning we, we try to estimate where in a given time period they would travel to, who or what the exposed uh, sensitive populations are, in most cases, we're focusing on human health effects. And then the last step is to model um, the economic cost, the monetary cost of that event. The economic damages from air pollution are largely concentrated with a few specific economic sectors. The top four sectors of the American economy, agriculture, utilities, manufacturing, and transportation, were responsible for more than 75% of all air pollution-related damage, while contributing just under 20% of the GDP. Currently, Agriculture has now moved above utilities as the leading contributor by sector to air pollution damages in, in the United States. And that is surprising to a lot of folks because we tend to think, you know, oh, it's got to be cars and trucks or it's got to be big factories. Things like tilling and the constrained animal feeding operations that are kicking up lots of dust ammonia emissions from waste management. These are all really important contributors to what is now on the order of $200 billion a year in damages coming from that sector in external um, public health effects. The bulk of the economic cost comes from health impacts, more specifically morbidity and mortality. Over the years, studies have shown a direct link between long-term exposure to poor air quality and premature death. It's estimated that more than 100,000 Americans die every year due to air pollution-related causes, and that leaves a significant burden on the economy. It leads to increased health care costs, and it also can have a devastating impact on the individuals uh, who are sickened by air pollution or uh, their families if, a, if someone dies due to air pollution. So that's where we see the enormous costs. On top of everything, the U.S. spends an additionally estimated $65 billion every year to clean up the air. The value of the air quality improvement solely for human health is estimated to cost $37 to $90 billion each year. Though we've invested a lot around the world in environmental improvements and, and air quality improvements and pollution control, you actually see a return to that investment when you adjust GDP to reflect the damages or costs from air pollution, because all those investments aren't yielding a benefit that we can see in GDP, but when we tabulate the social cost, we actually see the benefit and it shows up in that more rapid growth rate. And all that is a way of saying that it isn't necessarily the case that growth and the environment are opposing goals. Nonetheless, the U.S. has come a long way in terms of air pollution control, sometimes due to unforeseen circumstances like the coronavirus pandemic. As lockdowns led to steep decline in automobile use and local manufacturing, NASA reported that nitrogen dioxide concentration, one of the primary air pollutants, have reduced by nearly 20% since February 2020. But the Clean Air Act, passed in 1970, is still believed to be the most important environmental regulation that brought monumental changes to how the U.S. deals with air pollution. Both particle and ground-level ozone pollution saw a decline after it was passed into law. That added a little over a year and a half to the life expectancy of average Americans. The Clean Air Act was designed to eliminate those criteria pollutants that were most directly related to, uh, to human health, and they were designed to regulate taking human health as the baseline. The Clean Air Act came under major threat during the Trump administration, the same administration that was criticized for attempting to roll back more than 100 established environmental regulations. New York and Connecticut sued the Trump administration for failing to enforce the Clean Air Act, coming out victorious the following year. It feels very like a slap in the face to somebody like me who's worked my whole life as a very productive citizen, and yet I'm being told that your ability to breathe um, is not nearly as important as some of the other things that we've got going on, when that's very short-sighted. Another issue that needs to be addressed is environmental racism, or the disparities in the impact of air pollution. A recent study from the American Lung Association shows that people of color are three times as likely to live in the most polluted places in America. What it showed is that communities, uh, that poor communities and communities of color uh, tended to, to suffer 
uh, the effects of air pollution more greatly than uh, the population taken as, as a whole. Uh, and, and that's actually not surprising. I mean, the, 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 I think the data has, has indicated that before COVID-19, but what COVID-19 did was highlight that. With the Biden administration putting the emphasis back on environmental regulations, experts and those directly impacted by air pollution are cautiously optimistic with the future that lies ahead. I'm actually quite optimistic. He's, he's added uh, incredibly good people to his administration. It, it's going to be driven by, by facts, by science, but uh, contained within a commitment to, to, to justice. When I was six months old, my mother said, when we sat on Dauphin Island in Alabama for the first time in January, it's the first time I saw color in your face and the first time that you slept because you were able to breathe. No child deserves that. Let's do what we can.